So we have been working our way on in our uh, weekend services through the Gospel of Luke, and we're going to come back to that in three weeks. But um, as we consider, um, I, did, did, am, am I the only one? But it just seems like this year it just looks like the world is already blowing up. Has anybody noticed that already? So uh, because of that, um, here at Calvary, one of the things that we do is we talk a great deal about Bible prophecy. And I think we're going to do that quite a lot this year in 2024. But also in the midst of that and all that's going on, I believe that God wants to do something very specific in each one of our lives and then collectively as a church. And so as we begin this, this new year, what I wanted to do is just take three weeks uh, to look at the book of Nehemiah. It's one of, the, one of my favorite books. It's a favorite book, I think, of many pastors, most pastors, even the world studies the book of Nehemiah. Now, we're not gonna go through the whole book. We're only gonna go through three teachings in this book. Then we'll come back to the Gospel of Luke. Now, Nehemiah is considered one of the greatest leaders of all time. And what we'll find is that in this book, Nehemiah is one of the most practical, uh, practical uh, books that, that has ever been, been written. But what I love about Nehemiah so much is that Nehemiah is a picture of what it means to be spiritual. I, I think you'll agree that there is in our world a number of voices saying this is what it looks like to be spiritual. And, and you know, there's a, a lot of voices that say that. But what we notice is that in the Bible, it was spiritual people who actually accomplished something. So we love the story of David because it's the story of David and Goliath. He actually accomplished something. You go back to the book of Judges and you've got Gideon and uh, Gideon takes on a vast army with only 300 soldiers. And uh, the Bible, uh, in the last days, there's this great book called Daniel, and Daniel talks a great deal about the last days, but it says something about the last days, and I want you to look this up later to, to, to see that it really is. But in the last days, it says this in Daniel chapter 11, it says there in your outline that the people who know their God will display strength and take action. They're going to actually do something. So Nehemiah is a picture of someone who is very spiritual, but he's also a man of incredible action and accomplishment. So over the course of the next three weeks, we're going to look at three things. Today, we're going to look at how to, uh, how to gain a God-given personal life vision. We'll talk about that today. And then next week, once we receive our personal God-given vision for our life, we're going to talk about how do we set and, and achieve God-given goals. And Nehemiah is gonna walk us through that process. And then the third week, we're gonna talk about how do we keep from getting distracted or getting off track. So I don't know how it is for you, but, but if I'm not careful, I'll set some New Year's resolutions and, and just about three weeks, three Three days, I'm, I'm, off, I'm off track. Am I the only one who, who struggles with this? So we all do. So how do we stay on track so that we can accomplish what it is that, that God has for us? Now, let, let me just say, what we're gonna talk about today is for all of us. It's for all of us. If you are in junior high, uh, middle school, uh, high school, college, your young family, you're single, newly married, you know, whatever. If you are retired, this is for you. And here, here's what I wish. If I could go back, I wish the church that I grew up in would have talked about some of these things because some of these things did not, I, I didn't learn until I was about 30. And, uh, but thank God I learned them. But uh, I, I wish my church would have talked about some of these things earlier in, in my life. So today as we get into this, always the big question is what do you leave in and what do you leave out? Because um, there's so much more. I want to give you enough that you can go, okay, this makes sense, but there's more. There's more. So, so you study and, uh, and see what the Lord would reveal to you. So today is going to be the starting point. It's the starting point for Nehemiah. It's also the starting point for, for you and I. We all start, start here. And today what we're going to see is that God has a very specific purpose for Nehemiah, but the Bible teaches that God has a very specific purpose for each of us. There on your outline from Proverbs it says, and the Lord made everything for its own purpose. So you were created and designed by God with a specific purpose. I pulled one verse, I could have pulled 50. Um, and, and what we're finding in the New Testament is because we have some unique purposes, God promises to give us spiritual gifts that we use in order to accomplish our unique 
calling in life. Now, the reality is that everybody has a, a purpose in their life, but not everybody will step into their life purpose, their God-given vision for, for their life. But everyone can if they want to. They can if they want to, but not everybody does. So the way that God does this, God reveals his purpose for us uh, in what we would call a, a life vision. So there on your outline, I want you to write this down, that a vision is a picture of a destination. It's a picture of a destination. And I liken it to uh, this puzzle. This is a puzzle that has a thousand pieces in, in it. And uh, this puzzle represents our life. You know, we, in our lives, we have all of these pieces. Now, uh, I think you'll agree, if, if I just start with the pieces and I dump this out on the table, I can put this puzzle together. Uh, but it's gonna take a long time because I don't know what it's actually supposed to be. And, but but I, I could, it's just gonna take a whole lot longer and take a whole lot more energy. However, if I start with the vision that is the picture of the destination, what it's supposed to look like when it's finished, I think you'll agree, it's gonna make putting together the puzzle, uh, the pieces of our life a whole lot easier and we'll be able to do that a whole lot faster. So I want you to write this down. As the vision becomes clear, and this is the vision right here, this is the picture of what it's supposed to look like when it's all done. As the vision becomes clearer, the options become fewer. If I start with this picture, I realize that I'm, I'm, not, I'm not creating a mountain scene. I'm not, you know, all different things. This is what it's supposed to look like. So the options become fewer. Or the vision becomes clearer. The options become fewer. And, and the best part is that the decisions become easier. The decisions become easier because I know what I'm trying to accomplish. So when I know what the picture is, everything becomes easier because if it's a decision or something that I'm facing that helps me accomplish the vision, then it's a yes. But if it's something that takes me away from the vision, then it's automatically a no. But I gotta start with, with that vision. Now, on the other hand, to a verse that we're all familiar with, I'm gonna read it from two different uh, translations. On the other hand, in Proverbs, it says, where there is no vision, the people perish. And we've all heard that growing up. Here at Calvary, we tend to use the New American Standard, not because it's better than any other, it's just the one I grew up with, and so I, I, it's, it's hard for me to read from another one. But, but it says it like this, where there is no vision, the people are unrestrained. They're unrestrained. Uh, you and I live in a, in a world where there's a great deal of substance abuse, and I would suggest to you that the reason that so many people go into substance abuse, uh, they're unrestrained because they have never considered or discovered their personal life vision, and so without that vision, they're just unrestrained. We see our children growing up, and they're just floundering and, and I would suggest to you that a large reason for that would be that nobody has instilled a God-given personal life vision for them, so they're, they're just floundering. So many people go into marriage and they get a divorce because they, they've, never, they've never determined uh, what a vision, a, a God-given vision for marriage looks like. So they just get in and they go, but they don't know what it's supposed to look like, and so they become unrestrained. Ultimately, the marriage perishes. So this is not God God's plan for you to live your life like this. So without a vision, we perish. And again, a vision is simply the picture of the destination, the picture of the destination. So you and I were created, I believe, uh, for a very special reason, for a very special reason. And it all begins with a God-given vision for our lives. And the truth is, all of us are gonna wind up somewhere in our life. And uh, if we were to be honest, without that vision, many times we wind up in certain places in our life and we go, how did I get here? Uh, this is not where I wanted to, to wind up. So we need to start with that vision. And remember that a vision is a picture of a destination. As the vision becomes clearer, the options become fewer and the decisions become easier. And here's the good news. God wants you to have a God-given personal life vision for your life. And by the way, I'm gonna keep emphasizing a God 
God-given vision because uh, there's people who have visions, but it's not God-given. So God has made everything for its own purpose. And uh, so there on your outline, it says uh, the background to Nehemiah's story. So let me just give you some, some perspective here, how this whole situation began. For hundreds of years, uh, Israel had been living in sin, gross sin, uh, beyond you know, the, the normal, uh, normal everyday stuff. And uh, God kept telling them, if you don't repent, what's gonna happen is you're gonna lose your, your nation. Then there came a point where God says, you've gone beyond the place where you can repent. Now you're going to lose your nation. We call that the Babylonian exile. So there on your outline, in 586 BC, Jerusalem was destroyed and God's people were deported to Babylon. And you wanna write down, Babylon is just modern day Iraq. It's modern day Iraq. And uh, some people suggest that this actually began in 597 BC uh, because there was a deportation at that point, but Jerusalem was destroyed in 586. So some people point, point to that. Now, let me just say one thing on that. God's people went into exile, not because they sinned, not because they sinned. They went into exile because they would not repent. They would not repent. Well, so off to Babylon they go. And when they go to Babylon, you have these great stories of Daniel, Daniel in the lion's den. You have the stories of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. If you grew up in church and you went to church camp, you didn't say Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You said my shack, your shack, or Winnebago. But either way, so... Off, off to exile they go, 539 BC, the Babylonians get taken over by the Persians, and the Persians uh, is just modern day Iran. So you wanna write that, Iran. So um, actually, many people don't know that Persia was called Persia until the 1930s, and in the 1930s, they changed it to Iran, or Iran, however you'd say that. Well, in 537 BC, the first group of Jews are allowed to return to Israel. It's a very small group, uh, but in 516, uh, 70 years after the exile, the temple was rebuilt, and again, that's 70 years after the deportation. Now, we wanna pay attention to this one, 458 BC, Ezra, is going to lead a group of people back to Jerusalem. They're going to work on Jerusalem. They're gonna work on the temple, but this is going to be 13 years before Nehemiah. Keep that in mind as we go. Because in 445 BC, Nehemiah will ask permission to return to Jerusalem to rebuild the city walls. Now, um, so that's gonna take place. We're gonna talk about that today. Now, write this down. Nehemiah is the cupbearer to the king. And if you look at verse 11 of chapter one, last verse in the, in the chapter, look at the very last line. It just says, now I was the cup bearer to the king. Now we say cup bearer, but it's actually more than that. Um, any commentary that you get will say something like, I took this from Guzik's commentary. It says the cup bearer was a personal bodyguard to the king. Before you got to the king, you had to get through his, his cup bearer, his bodyguard. Other commentaries will say bodyguard, the king's personal representative. Some suggest it was the equivalent to secretary of the state, and that, that could all be true. But either way, this was a very prominent position in the kingdom. Having said that, I'm gonna jump into verse one. I'm gonna read the first three verses. We'll underline some things as we go. So verse one, it says, the words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah. Now it happened in the month Chislev. You want to underline Chislev. Then the 20th year, while I, I was in Susa, underline Susa, the capital, that Hanani, one of my brothers and some men from Judah came and I, I asked him concerning the Jews who had escaped and had survived the captivity and about Jerusalem. And, and then you want to underline, they said to me, 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 uh, the remnant there in the province who survived the captivity are in great distress and reproach. And the wall of Jerusalem, this here's going to be the problem, is broken down and its gates are burned with fire. Gates are burned with fire. So there's a, a few things as we get into this that, that we need to know. First of all, um, when we went through, I emphasized I, I, and, and you know, it's, it's a, so the, here, here's the thing. Nehemiah writes in the first person. The entire book is in the first person. So write this down when it says, you know, they said to me there in your outline, but the book of Nehemiah is a diary. It's a diary. It's his own personal diary. And uh, there's a life lesson in that, and it's simply this. And you want to write this down that a life worth living is a life worth recording. 
a life worth living is a life worth recording. Uh, some of you might not call it a diary, you might call it journaling at this point. But parents, I want you to just consider this for, for a second. How cool would it be if you journaled in your life and you wrote down the things that you're facing, the decisions, how you process things, and then at the end of your life, you're able to give that to your kids and they could read back through and go, oh, this was what mom and dad were thinking. Here's how they made th that decision. Here's why they, they did these things. What an incredible heritage that would be. Um, the guy who taught me to journal, uh, he said every day when he began his journal, he began with the same two words. And the same two words were always, yesterday, I, and then it went on from there. Yesterday, I, and it went on from there. So I would encourage you to just, just think that through. What a cool thing that would be to pass on to, to your kids. So here's the problem, and you wanna write this down, that the walls of Jerusalem are destroyed. Now that's not a big deal to you and I. But in those days, that would be a huge embarrassment because the, your wall around your city was your first line of defense. And uh, so as you tried, if your walls were destroyed and the gates were burned, uh, as you tried to tell people how great and awesome your God was and why you should worship our, our God, they would look on at you and say, really, worship your God? Look what he's done for you. Your gates are torn down. You're getting attacked all the time. Place has been burned to the ground. So this would be a great embarrassment. Now, another thing um, that you find in the Bible is that names are always, always, always significant. Uh, there's three names. I'm just going to talk about one so far that we've looked at, but they're all significant. So we have Nehemiah here. Now, Nehemiah is a compound word in the original language, nekam yah, and uh, it means comfort uh, and God, or the comfort of God is literally what it means. So here's what we're going to find. Because Nehemiah will have a personal God-given life vision God is going to use him to be, and you want to write this down, the comfort of God to an entire nation, to an entire nation. So Nehemiah hears the news. All this has happened. Here's how he responds in verse four. He says, now when I heard these words, I sat down and wept, underline that, and mourned for days, and I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. Now we're gonna find as we go that Nehemiah is actually going to pray for four months as this all comes more clear to him. And there's 11 prayers in the book of Nehemiah. We won't go through them, but there's 11 prayers. I didn't have room on the outline, uh, but, I, but I, if I did, I wanted to put in that what we find is that people with a God-given vision will do more than pray, but they don't do anything until they pray. And so every, this, this whole book is gonna be filled with prayer, filled with prayer. So I'll read Nehemiah's prayer and then we'll come back and make, make some comments. Verse five, he says, I said, I beseech you, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who preserves the covenant and loving kindness for those who love him and keep his commandment. Uh, Nehemiah bases his prayer based upon who God is. He's the God who keeps his commandment. He's filled with loving kindness. And then verse six and seven, it says, let your ear now be attentive to you and, and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant, which I am praying before you now. And then you wanna underline day and night, day and night. So this is not a one-time prayer. This is gonna be how he's praying day and night. On behalf of the sons of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins of the sons of Israel, which we, we, uh, have sinned um, against you. I, I, and my father's house have sinned. We, we have acted corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments nor the statutes nor the ordinances which you commanded your servant Moses. What I find interesting there is that Nehemiah includes himself as, as being part of the problem, but he's, he's never actually been to Israel. He was born in Persia. He had nothing to do with that, but he includes himself. Verses eight and nine, we're going to notice that Nehemiah will pray the promises of God. So verse eight, it says, remember the word which you commanded your servant Moses saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But verse nine, if you return 
to me and keep my commandments and do them, though those of you who have been scattered were in the re- most remote part of heavens, uh, I will gather them from there and I will bring them to the place where I have chosen to cause my name to dwell. I'll bring, them to the, I'll, I'll bring you back in. So he begins to pray the promise. He knows we've turned back to you, Lord. Now we're expecting you to bring us back in, into the land. Well, verses um, 10 and 11, it says, they are your servants and your people whom you've redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. Oh Lord, I beseech you, may your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and the prayer of your servants who delight to revere your name and make your servant successful. Does your Bible say successful? You wanna underline, some of your, some of your Bibles will say prosperous or prosper. Either way, you wanna underline that. Make your servant successful today and grant him compassion before this man. Now I was the cupbearer to the king. Um, I, I love that Nehemiah prays for success. Some people think that it's unspiritual to pray for success, but con- consider the alternative. You know, do, do you pray for failure? I don't know how it is for you, but failure just kind of happens kind of on its own in my life. So, so I need to pray for, for success. So what I want to do today is as we went through that, I just want to highlight how it is the process that God uses to give us that personal God-given uh, life vision, and we're going to make some, we're ask some questions, and we're going to make some observations, and then my hope is that this will become your homework, that you take this and you begin to think through uh, what it is that God wants to do in your life. Again, whether you're at the beginning of your life or you're retired, going on, um, God still wants to do something in your life. So how does God give a personal life vision? Let me go sidetrack a little bit as we get into this Um, first of all, in the box, in verse four, I put that there. It says, when I heard these things, I sat down and wept and I mourned. And so in Nehemiah's life, what we find is that God uses some pain in his life in order to uh, make that be part of of his, the vision that God has for him. And sometimes God does that, that sometimes we walk through some stuff and then God uses that for, for our personal life vision. And that's certainly a possibility. Now for some of us, it's a little bit different. Um, it's not always gonna be just pain, but in uh, Psalm 37, it says, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. It's not that he fulfills the desires, but as you delight yourself in him, he gives you the desires that he wants you to have as you delight in him. So, so as we delight in him, uh, we're gonna find that he will begin to put the desires that he has, that he wants us to have so that we can accomplish that life purpose. So that's certainly the way that he does that. Now, a little bit of self-disclosure uh, from my life, and I won't tell the whole story, but just very, very condensed. I, I grew up in church, and I've been in church since I was five years old. And uh, growing up in church, we were always taught to read our Bibles, but we never opened our Bibles in church. It was just, you know, I'm a great, I have the most wonderful church background. I've been all over the church block. It's been weird, it's been wacky, but it's always been wonderful. Everywhere I've been, people love the Lord. Um, but one church that I sat under, um, I sat under what we would describe as the screaming pastor. How many of you here ever sat under the screaming pastor? Yes, I see that hand. For those of you listening online, thousands of hands are going up all over the auditorium. If you haven't listened to the screaming pastor, you haven't lived. But it was just a lot of screaming, a lot of screaming. Now, other parts, and I'm not against this at all, but I, part of my church background was you would come to church and you could barely get to your seat because there were people laying in the aisle and, and all types of things going on. But we didn't open our Bible. There was a lot going on, but we didn't open our Bible. And for me, I grew up and I was always fascinated by the Bible. I would, I would read the Bible, but then I would come to these things and I would say, you know, what, what does this mean? Could somebody just explain it to me? Well, we didn't get that in our church. We, we got at times in this church screaming, this church, and, and you know, so very, very um, different stuff. Um, but as God allowed me to go through a number of church experiences, 
you know, I was fascinated by the Bible and uh, God began to, a couple of years before Cheryl and I moved here, began to move in my, my life. Like, this is what you're to do. And God gave me a, a verse and it comes from Ezra, one of the guys that we talked about a few moments ago, Ezra 7.10. And it says, for Ezra there in your outline had set his heart to study the law of the Lord and to practice it, underline practice it, practice it, and to teach his statutes and ordinances in Israel. So the Lord gave that to me. So, so part of what I'm, major part of what I'm to do is I'm to study it, but then I'm to practice it. And uh, as it works out in my life, then I'll come and I'll teach it to you. But I will never teach you anything that I'm not practicing. Um, because if you're like me, I've been around the, the block and I've seen a lot of people preaching stuff that they weren't necessarily practicing. So my goal is to always make sure that I'm practicing what it is that I'm preaching it. So that's, that's part of how God did that in, in my life. So God is going to use a variety of things in our life in order to give us our personal life vision. Mine is different than, than yours. So how, how does God give, uh, what do we know about uh, that personal life vision? Well, I want you to write this down. Uh, if it's from God, it's going to begin with an impossible situation, an impossible situation. Now, I want to talk about that impossible situation. So it's, God's going to give this to Nehemiah, um, and Jerusalem is over 800 miles away. So you want to write that down, 800 miles away. Let me put a map up here just to show you what I mean. All the way to the right of the screen, you have Iran, in those days Persia, and you had that city called Susa. And Jerusalem, you gotta go through Iraq and Jordan, of course it wasn't called that then, to get to Israel, which is all the way to the left side of the screen. And it's 800 miles as a crow would fly. But you got mountain ranges, you got kingdoms, you got all this stuff. So most told that it was more like a thousand miles away. So what does that mean? Well, I'll write this down. That's at least two months by camel. So that's, it's, it's quite a distance. Uh, most people put the journey back to Jerusalem at about four months. Now, it's also going to be impossible in that, you want to write this down, Nehemiah has no experience. Uh, he's never built anything. He's never organized a project. He certainly has never done this internationally so in order for Nehemiah to accomplish this life vision, he's gonna have to learn some things. He's gonna have to grow and he's gonna be stretched. And so we're gonna talk about that more next week, but it doesn't just happen. It's not gonna just happen. Also, to add to the impossibility, we have to consider who Nehemiah's boss is. So everybody look at chapter two, verse one. Chapter two, verse one. And it says, now it came about in the month of Nisan. Uh, it's Nisan, they used to call it Datsun, but then they changed it, it's now Nisan. <laughs> you have to be like over 50 years old to, to get that. <laughs> Some of you 30 somethings are like, what? <laughs> All right, so it came about in the month of Nisan, actually, in the 20th year, King Artaxerxes, that wine was brought before him. So the king here that he's working for is Artaxerxes, Artaxerxes. Now, Ezra goes back to Israel about 13 years before Nehemiah asks for permission. And that's the book before Nehemiah, and you can read that. And so he goes there, but the people are opposed to the work of God rebuilding Jerusalem, rebuilding the temple. So I've condensed the whole chapter, but you'll get the point. In chapter four of Ezra, it says, so they wrote a letter against Jerusalem to King Artaxerxes as follows. And you can read that later, but it's very negative. And then it says, then as soon as the copy of King Artaxerxes' document was read, he's going to make a decision based upon what he hears. And it says, and they went in haste to Jerusalem to the Jews and stopped them by force of arms. The idea is if you don't stop, we're gonna kill you. So here, here's, here's the, the impossible situation. The problem that needs to be solved is in a distant country. The guy to solve it has no experience. And the only guy who can help him has promised to kill anybody who tries to do this. This is an impossible situation. Would you agree with that? So it's an impossible situation. Now, here's why that's so important. 
when God gives you that life vision, he puts these extreme, uh, these extreme um, uh, details in there uh, so to teach us that we look at God, not our circumstances. Because if we look at our circumstances, there's no way we do this. So we have to ask ourselves, what is the impossible situation that God has placed in, in, in front of us? If it's not impossible, um, then you really don't need God to, to do it. Well, so the first thing we notice is it's going to begin with an impossible situation. And then uh, Nehemiah will understood, or he understood God's purpose in his generation. So you, Nehemiah lived in a very unique generation. God had told the people that because you would not repent, you're going to go into exile, but he set a certain amount of time. So Jeremiah wrote about this, and I've condensed this, and you can read the expanded later. Um, Jeremiah said, this is about 100, 150 years before um, Nehemiah. This whole land will be a desolation and a horror, and these nations will serve the king of Babylon 70 years, 70 years. Then it will come about when these 70 years are completed. I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, declares the Lord. You see, what God was going to do was all laid out in the Bible, and Nehemiah understood that the 70 years had passed in the same way. You and I live in the generation that God speaks more about than any other generation in human history. And the Bible talks about when Israel became a nation again. Israel is the only nation on the planet in the history of the world that existed as a nation, ceased to exist as a nation for almost 2,000 years, became a nation again, just as the Bible said. And the Bible says that things will be dramatically different and going in a certain direction when that takes place, which is why we talk a great deal about Bible prophecy here at Calvary. Things are happening and will continue to happen just like the Bible says. In church world today, there are some who reject what the Bible says about this generation. And they have a vision, but their vision goes just the opposite of how God says this generation is going to go. And uh, they say, we're gonna take it in this direction. And that's mostly what we see in church world today. That would not be a God-given vision because God never contradicts himself. He doesn't say, this is where it's going, and then we go, but we want it to go this way. We need to align ourselves with what it is that God says. So on the other hand, there are those who understand fully what God says that's going to take place in this generation, and they say, well, why even bother? I mean, we see where it's going to go. Well, in Luke chapter 19, Jesus gives a parable about what we're to be doing until he comes for us. And uh, I love this one little verse, Luke 19, 13. It says, occupy until I come, occupy until I come. So we want to participate and align ourselves with what we see the Bible says in this generation, and, but we're going to occupy until he comes, um, and, and we're not going to say we're going in a different direction. We're going to align ourselves with what he says. So Nehemiah knew what God had said about his particular generation, that he would bring his people back into their homeland. If the vision that you are getting is not aligning with what it is that God says about this generation, I would suggest to you that that's a vision, but it would not be a God-given vision because God does not contradict himself. Well, another thing that we will find is that a God-given vision will involve concern for the things that God is concerned about. In verse four, we underlined it. He said, I sat down and I wept, and he, he was praying. So when Nehemiah hears that this takes place, um, you know, the walls are burned down. He doesn't go, oh, it's just really too bad. I'm sad that that happened. Oh, well, uh, it says that he sat down and he wept. His heart was broken over the things that God was concerned about. So God's plan for Nehemiah and each of us will always involve a concern about the things that God is concerned about. If your life vision is from God it's always going to involve being concerned about what God is concerned about. Now, I say that because 
We live in a world where people have a vision and their vision goes like this. I wanna have this house and this car and live in this neighborhood and, and their vision is all about them. Guys, I hope you have a great house. I hope you have a great car. I hope you do well and you prosper and that's all good. You, I, you, you know, I want, God wants that for you. But if you leave out the things that God is concerned about in your vision, that is no longer a God-given vision because a God-given vision is always concerned about the things that God is concerned about. Would that make sense to you? And, and again, I, I wanna see you be blessed and prosper and do great and, and, and all of that. But it has to include, if it's God-given, it's gonna be involved the things that God is concerned about. So what is it that God is concerned about? Well, one verse, I could give you 50, you could give me 50. There in your outline, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save the lost. God is concerned about people. He is concerned about where they spend eternity. He is concerned about when they come to know him, they're born into his family spiritually, that they grow up in him, and he is concerned about their current condition. God is always concerned about people. So when you have a God-given personal life vision, it's going to include the things that God is concerned about. We also notice that, and write this down, that it's in the wrestling through prayer with what was and what could be, a vision is born. A vision is born. Verse six, we underline day and night. He, this was not something that happened because he sat down for 15 minutes or an hour. This, this took some time. He was praying day and night. There on your outline, it says, from the month of Chislev to Nizon, uh, in chapter two, verse one, is a period of four months. You wanna write that down. So he's praying about this for four months, but it just becomes more and more clear over time. So, so it's not gonna happen in 10 or 15 minutes. It's over, over time. Verse 11 of chapter one, it says, O Lord, I beseech you, may your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight to revere your name and to make your servants successful today and grant him compassion before this man. Now I was the cupbearer to the king. If I were to take that verse and I were just to paraphrase that verse, over the four months, here's what's taken place. Nehemiah says, I'm available, I'm available. And then he prays for success. He says, Lord, grant your servant success today. It's in the, this time of difficulty, this challenge, this problem shows up in Nehemiah's life. And Nehemiah, like all of us, has a choice that he's going to make. How is he going to respond? So he could say, you know, I'm the cupbearer to the king. You know, I, I, it's a great job here. I'm very comfortable. I have no experience in doing those things. You know, all is going well for me. You need to find somebody else to do that. And, and if he did that, I, I don't think any of us would blame him. I don't think any of us would blame him because it would make a lot of sense. But he has a choice to make. He can either say yes to God's plan or he can, he can reject it. Just like all of us, we can either say, yes, I'm available. Or we can say, well, that's, uh, I'm not, not doing that. Write this down. That the vision from God is always greater than anything we could ever accomplish apart from him. Apart from him. You see, apart from that God-given vision, um, we tend to just go through life. We, we were not aiming at anything. Just kind of go this way, that way, and see how it, it turns out. But if you're going to accomplish something significant in your life, a God-given vision, it's gonna be greater than anything that you could ever do apart from God. When God gives you that God-given vision as you see that begin to take place and it unfolds and you're w walking and working with the Lord to accomplish that, you're gonna find that there's a sense of fulfillment there that you'll never experience in any other way because it's what you are designed by God to do. And so if, if it's not something greater than you can, that, you know, that if you could do it without God, then it wouldn't require faith. You know, just, just go do it. God gives you a vision that's gonna be bigger than, than what you could accomplish uh, with, without him. So once we get that, once we begin to, we pray and we discern and over time, that vision becomes clearer what it's to look like then once that becomes clear, then the next thing, and we're gonna talk about this 
next week, how do we begin to establish some goals, God-given goals, that take us so that we can accomplish that vision that God has for us? I believe that we live in some very challenging times, and I think it's gonna get more challenging, but we're still here, and God still wants to do some things in us and through us and in this time and place where he's allowed us and called us to be. But, but, but we have to be willing to step into, into that. So I would encourage you, take this week, go through this, read the chapter. The Lord's gonna show you some more things than I brought out today. But uh, let the Lord begin to do that. And let this year be very different maybe than some of the other years that, that we've had. What did you find that interesting today? Good. So with that, I'll close in prayer. Communion will be served down in the front on both sides of the platform. Prayer partners are in the care room just outside to the the right. Let's pray. Lord, we, we we want to know your purpose, the vision that you have for us. So we're gonna begin praying that you make it very clear. I know it comes in pieces, comes over time. Uh, It's great when it happens as a flash of light, but for most of us, it's gonna take a little bit of time, soul searching, praying, seeking you, discerning, and, uh, but but Lord, uh, we want that because living out the purpose that you designed us for is the most fulfilling, most fulfilling thing ever. So we we wanna partner with you in that. Lord, I'm so grateful for this congregation, their love for you, the things of you, your spirit, your word, and I pray, God, that you keep each and every one of us until we meet again. It's in Jesus' name that we pray, and all God's people said, amen. Amen. God bless you, we love you, we'll see you next time.